folks, it's Mr. Nobody. Welcome to another episode of Making Nobody Happy. Now, I'm getting a little rough in the voice right now. It's wearing down. I've had a little bit of sickness. But there's something I really want to talk about and I really want to try and get through today. And it's a question. Why are things so crazy right now? So not long ago, um, I watched Douglas Murray give the same talk three times on modern wisdom, on trigonometry, and again with Jordan Peterson. And actually later on, just for curiosity, I also checked out two or three more instances and glanced through them that he gave the same talk. So he had a new book coming out, The War on the West, uh, which if you're curious who is waging this war against the West, his argument is uh, the West. It's the West's own internal war against itself. Anyway, before he had gone on that recent press tour, I could tell that He'd been busy doing something because he seemed to be unusually absent for a while. And then suddenly he was back on the scene being interviewed by everyone. Now, I've done a brief review of this book uh, on this YouTube channel. So check that out if you want to know what I thought about it. Uh, Murray has clearly been reading his Thomas Sowell. And it's nice to see a short, easy to read book that brings some of the same ideas to a broader audience. Uh, not everyone's going to read Soul because his books are older and longer and they're so full of detail. And Douglas managed to craft a shorter, simpler take on some of the same material that's easy for people to access. And that's great. So that's, that's just my general thoughts on the book. But uh, this, what I want to talk about now, isn't an another review of the book or a discussion of even the themes or the arguments in it. Instead, I want to talk about one question that people kept asking Douglas during his interviews. Why now? Why this? Why is all this happening at this point in time um, in this way? What is the underlying cause of all this controversy, this derangement, this distress? What, what caused the war, essentially? What is causing all this conflict? Now, of course, there are a thousand tiny answers to the myriad specifics of how any moment in time became just the moment that it is. Uh, but people want to know what the source of all this madness of crowds is uh, in some meaningful human sense that we can grasp. Uh, what drives it? Yes, there are many factors, but I'm a person. I need something I can grasp. I need something I can respond to. What, what motivates this kind of conflict, this animosity, this desire to destroy, to see, to see it all be torn down? It's a long way, after all, to go from criticizing something to wanting to see it all torn down and swept away. Uh, and Douglas clearly makes the case in his book that, that is exactly what so many people are feeling and are demanding. Now, that that isn't just a phenomenon. That, that's a sickness of the heart. That is a sickness at the heart of a whole civilization that demands explanation. Now, many different contemporary thinkers have offered their own explanations for the craziness that has infected our civilization. Jordan Peterson would describe it, I think, as the spirit of Cain trying to assert itself. The innate desire, the innate instinct to resent and to destroy when our sense of meaning cannot be captured by a more positive and productive vision. Douglas Murray, maybe, would see it as another attempt uh, by the spirit of Marxism, which might be an avatar of the spirit of Cain, trying to bring down the West again, just through, through a new kind of formulation. Brett Weinstein and Heather Haying would probably say it's a symptom of the derangement caused by unregulated hyper-novelty unmooring us from the institutions that previously regulated our emotions and sanity. And Jonathan Haidt would probably agree with them. Ben Shapiro would say it's a consequence of our becoming unmoored from the foundational religious ideas that provide the background value system that undergirds Western society institutions. Mary Eberstadt would say that it's the result of us becoming estranged from the stabilizing and productive influences of our natural familial pack structure, leading to deranged behavioral expressions like animals kept in a bad zoo. Thomas Sowell might say it's the natural historical result of the unconstrained vision being put into unregulated practice again, this time in the highly connected Western democracies, particularly the Eastern English-speaking brethren. 
Camille Paglia would say it's the political and cultural culmination of Western de decadence revealed in the degradation of its art and central mythological and sociosexual concepts, which cut the heart out of our culture decades ago. Theodore Dalrymple would probably say it's the result of a blind adolescent destructiveness resulting from the squalor that arises when a civilization is betrayed by those who should have been its defenders. Larry Elder would say it's the short-term profiteering of hustlers looking to purchase their own power and enrichment at the expense of the genuine well-being of the disadvantaged. Uh, revolutions are chaos in which the canny can get rich. Uh, Alan Bloom would say it's the natural consequence of the death of virtue and reason, which go hand in hand. Gad Sad would say it's the inflammation resulting from a terminal infection of our culture by, an, by ideological pathogens, which infected us because we were decadent and unconcerned with our own health, and we wanted easy answers and simple solutions. Victor Davis Hanson and Neil Ferguson would probably both say it's the result of ignorance of the past, because the people of the present are absolutely drowning in the sea of their own busy moment in history, and all the distractions and impulsive pleasures it affords, making the modern citizen easy to mislead and irresponsible. Sam Harris would say that people are always at risk of falling back into primitivism if they lack respect for reason. John McWhorter would say, maybe, that people don't know how to realize when they've had too much of a good thing, and don't know when to stop. All those explanations read like the explanations of the Old Testament, when the prophesied disaster has finally befallen, and the people are crying out and wondering why, why. The prophets give various answers. You forgot the lessons of the past. You forgot the duties laid on you. You forgot your God. You forgot to keep watch. You forgot to keep the knowledge alive. You forgot how you got here. You forgot who and what made all this possible. You forgot about others. You forgot about yourself. You forgot about your enemies. You forgot to read. You forgot to listen. You forgot to practice what you knew. You let your guard down. You let in things you knew were dangerous. You indulged in your own pleasures and distractions to the detriment of guarding the future. You were selfish. You were greedy. You were dissolute. It's a very familiar litany. Above all, the prophets say, you forgot the Lord your God. And for the Jews, that meant everything. Their faith was the foundation of their culture and what sustained it. It wasn't a place because they often lost it. It wasn't wealth because they rarely had it. It wasn't power because they were all a small people among giants. It wasn't a royal line because they didn't even have one for large parts of their history. It wasn't even a racial lineage because most of the tribes were lost and even those that weren't mixed with and even welcomed other people among them as full members. The Jewish people were defined by a covenant with their God. That was their ultimate origin. They were founded on a contract, an idea, and closed in a matrix of mutual obligation and action between themselves and the nature of being. They were a constitutional people. It was one that was defined by free association and contingent on choice and honoring the terms of the agreement. And it was continually brought home to them that their identity and all the benefits they derived from it were dependent on knowing and understanding and executing on that contract. This was the contract that defined them. This was the contract on which everything depended. And if they forgot it, if they forgot their God and forgot the terms under which their kingdom was founded, it crumbled. Now, America isn't a theocracy, per se, but it does have a certain idea uh, of what the founding metaphysical and moral and, and epistemological order is, a, a guiding idea as well as a practical vision of how we should relate to that idea. We hold these things to be self-evident, therefore blah, 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 blah. So the American, the concept of America is much more ideological and therefore theological than an alternative founded in something more tangible, like race or land or royal lineage. America is a constitution. It's a contract 
between people and between the nature of the world, which they held to be self-evident, certain truths and moral realities that spells out how that relationship will be structured in the state and what the obligations of the parties are. It, it's, it's, it's a contract. The Constitution tells us of its theory of who we are and what sort of world we live in and then prescribes how we might live in it. And it lays certain duties and responsibilities on us while granting us freedoms to pursue them. It's, it's a covenant. It's, a, it's almost like a wedding agreement. It, it is a bargain, a contract. Not that different in many ways from the Jews, even, even if it's not explicitly with a theological entity like God. It is a contract with an idea. So, America isn't just a land. Because when this contract was formed, most of America didn't even exist. <laughs> and it was new, and that land belonged to a different country. The foundation of America wasn't, wasn't wealth or a heritage of tradition because those had yet to be won. It wasn't a race because America set itself apart from its own founding race and races and declared a new identity and included new members. So it wasn't a ruling dynasty because America didn't have one. America was a contract, and a contract only lasts and only functions as long as it's understood, as long as it is, it is honored. Contracts are contingent upon the choice of free association and the assumption of a whole matrix of ideas and obligations that must be performed. There is no guarantee other than faith that the contract that was America would hold together then when it was created. And there's nothing else that holds it together now. The problem is, America no longer knows nor wants the burden of its bargain. It no longer wants to be held to the terms of a contract that no one now alive devised or consented to. We've forgotten it. Or if we haven't forgotten it, we reject its obligations. It's a marriage of inheritance. And the civilized world wants a divorce. We've fallen out of love with Western civilization. All we can see are its faults. All we can remember are its wrongs. And yet we're bound to it. And that proximity breeds disgust, abuse, exploitation, and hatred. The god of the West has fallen, and with him his empire. Life yearns to be thrown back into that primordial chaos of destruction and renewal. There's a hunger for suffering, even for punishment, born out of the need to survive in a world where survival has become too easy. The things we have to take for granted in our lives are so big, we can barely even comprehend them. So they need to be erased. They need to be thrown back into the chaos of something more comprehensible and malleable. Uh, something that makes us feel like something more compared to this vast thing that we have been born into. And the vast greatness of it alone, just an offense. It can't stand upon the rotten timbers that have long lain forgotten beneath its weight, unwatered like the sunken timbers of an Indian monolith. And just in case you didn't know, many massive stone Indian buildings are actually supported by wooden foundations. They resisted crumbling for so long because immersion in water prevented their decay. But as the water table has fallen, those timbers begin to dry out and to rot. And the whole giant edifice begins weighing down on them. And we are condemned to the ruin of a paradise that hasn't made a paradise in our hearts. We're ruined by a heaven that remains corrupted by our humanity. We feel a desperate need to test the claims of its eternity. We long to wage a war against heaven. Now, I don't really think, for as dramatic as that sounded, that our problems are really all that complicated. Society is made up of people. And whatever deranges, whatever deranges us does so by the means that afflict all people, that falls upon hearts just like the ones that we possess. Our problems are very simple, but they're no less immense for being simple. We're unhappy. 
unhappy with the world, unhappy with the past, unhappy with the present, unhappy with our comforts, unhappy with our opportunities, unhappy with our safety, unhappy with each other, unhappy with men, unhappy with women, unhappy with wealth, unhappy with poverty, unhappy with life, unhappy with death. We're unsatisfied and we don't know how to be content. The very fact that we have so much and need to do so little makes our unhappiness an even more despairing problem. It doesn't matter what we do or don't do. We don't matter. God and his world offend us. We keep gathering more and doing more and seeing more and hearing more and building more. But for what? That's why there's a suicidal instinct in our culture. We long to be destroyed, if only for the chance to see history begin again, if only to forget, if only to pay the price of all the guilt and arbitrary suffering that we feel crushing down on us. Like all the creatures that have ever lived, like all humans, we feel the burden of blood upon us. We feel the desperate need to sacrifice, the horror of being that cannot be hidden by our comforts but only recognized by the unleashing and placation of nightmares. And if no suitable subject can be found, we'll sacrifice ourselves, if only to see if anyone cares, if some different world can be bought. Personally, I think we're mo what we're most unhappy with is ourselves and other people. And that probably sounds idiotic, isn't that everyone... I think we're unhappy with the fact of ourselves and with the fact of other people. I think we're unhappy with ourselves specifically and with the people close to us in particular. <clears throat> and we don't know what to do about it. So we look anywhere and we chase anything and blame anyone and we try anything and we endure anything rather than to have to just sit and be alone with ourselves and other people. Because if it all stopped for just one day, we wouldn't know who we were or where we are going in this universe. And maybe it's better to burn out than to just fade away. That's all. We'll see you next time.